You've been lied to, but you don't know how. You've searched, you've struggled, you've cried out. You want the truth, but where is it? You've wandered, you've fought, you've strived, and you have not been satisfied. What is truth? Where is truth? Who is truth? The kingdom of God. Mind control. The last days. Higher dimensions. Unity. The power of faith. Discovering the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. God has promised that he will hide us under his feathers and under his wings we will trust. His truth shall be our shield and our buckler. Discovering the Truth with Dan Devon is the premier program that is designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program is designed to show you how to become more than you have ever imagined through the power of truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And now, prepare for your host, Dan Duvall. Today we're going to be talking about what I'm calling Deliverance 101 on Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Now, I spend a lot of time on this program, guys. We are always talking about high-level stuff. I mean, like, really weird stuff, you know, like out there and all of that and things that make people really uncomfortable and make preachers squeamish and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But today I want to talk about Deliverance 101, which is basic stuff, you know. I just feel like sometimes we need to go and review the basics as we are on a journey with the Lord because sometimes we overthink the reach of our own problems and really we may be thinking, oh, well, I need this complicated tool, that complex thing, whatever, and really we just need some basic confession, repentance, and renunciation in Jesus' name. And so we're going to be talking about Deliverance 101 and how to be free from what I would say is more of the surface level stuff. I mean, before you get to the bloodline, genetic iniquity, and before you get to the principalities that are anchored in through ritualization and all kinds of other hidden stuff, and then the other realms and that, you know, there is this place where there are a lot of believers that are simply battling with a demon of anger or bitterness or resentment, and that's where they're stuck. And, 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 and really, there are very straightforward methods of getting free of this stuff. And I'm going to be talking about some of that today. And, you know, I think that this is just going to be a very helpful podcast for a lot of people. I think it's going to have a wide reach because you know what? The basics apply even when the advanced and high level stuff is present. See, the basics never stop applying. You, you never stop needing salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, even when you get into understanding that you are a kingdom citizen and supposed to engage with the realms of heaven. Jesus is still the only door, you know, and so we always need the basics. And, and that's why we're talking about it today. Guys, of course, I um. I am an advocate for going to, into the deep things. I, I love to do it because, you know, it's a lot of fun. But um, really, we're going to be focusing in. Now today, we're going to begin a conversation on Deliverance 101 with the question, can the enemy touch Christians? Now, there are a good number of people, even now, that still believe, no. Uh, if you are saved, you are covered by the blood of Jesus, you have become the righteousness of God in Christ, and you're free. And, and see, this, this, this becomes a really challenging uh, concept to propagate because what happens is if you do not acknowledge that people are struggling with demonically inspired problems or that they have back doors or that Christians are being afflicted in various different kinds of ways, then everything becomes a question of were they ever really saved in the first place, right? Because if you have a Christian that's falling in the area of 
anger or falling in the area of lust or falling in the area of this or that and they you know they're just you know hitting the wall then the judgmentalism comes in where it's like well instead of applying ministry to this individual we're going to apply his judgment you were never really saved because if you were saved you wouldn't be doing this and therefore since you are doing this you are not saved so let's get you saved again were you really baptized? Well, I don't know if you're really baptized. Was the person that baptized you, did they baptize you in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Maybe your baptism was botched, and that's why you're in this pit. Let's baptize you again. You know, folks, I was baptized three times, and I'm not even going to touch that. What, what I'm getting at is sometimes we can, you know, go into this judgment place because we, we don't realize how uh, God designed this journey of sanctification to look. And, you know, sanctifying means to be set apart. And the process of God setting us apart includes the conversation of breaking us free from the defilements, the demonic infiltrations, and these kinds of things, so on and so forth. And so, you know, there are people that still believe, hey, yeah, the enemy shouldn't be able to touch Christians. Well, I want to begin with that question because it's good to know why the enemy can touch Christians. Now, here's what the Bible says in 1 John 5, 18. It says, we know that whoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Now that's interesting because I just said that the enemy can touch Christians, but here we have First John five eighteen, which says he can't. And so the uh, the 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 thing is, there is actually scriptural reason for concluding that the enemy cannot touch believers. That that, that you know, hands off, devil. Uh, the the person is saved and they are covered by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, you can't touch them. It's all over for you. You're done. Saved, done. You're done, devil. Get out. And um, it's really 1 John 5, 18. And so I'm not offended or I don't really get, well, I do get upset, but it more it's because of the way it affects people, not because of the logic behind the conclusion. You know, there, there really is a scriptural reason to say, yeah, the enemy can't touch believers. For 1 John 5, 18. And so I will say there's no question that the Bible actually does say the wicked one touches him not. Who? Those that are begotten of God. That means um, those that have been born into the kingdom of God as sons of God. Like, yeah, we are born again. But the interesting thing about this passage in 1 John 5, 18 is that right before that, we see John writing statements um, such as whoever is born of God doesn't sin. Now, this is really interesting because if you've ever met a Christian, I guarantee you, you've met somebody who sins. Now, I don't call Christians sinners anymore because I realize that this is an identity issue. We don't identify as being a sinner because we get a new identity in Christ Jesus. But we still, as a redeemed son or daughter of God, do sin. And so here we have a, a, a some weirdness going on because in 1 John 5 18 we're like wait a minute Christians sin and yet John is saying that whoever is born of God does not sin so how does that make any sense um as a matter of fact in this same book in 1 John 1 8 John goes and says if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us now how is it that John could be in chapter 1 writing and saying if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and uh, the truth is not in us. And yet, say, in the fifth chapter of the same book, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Like, that just seems like a total contradiction. And I, I'll tell you what, I've, I, I've struggled through 1 John. Um, and I, I've read it it's just so much. I mean, the book is loaded with revelation. I'll tell you, John, I, some people call him the apostle of love. He understood Jesus in a very special way. Um, as a matter of fact, he even referred to himself in his own gospel as um, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It, he put his head upon the breast of Jesus. It, it, this is this guy really got it. He just got it. And and you know, uh, yet here he is he seems to be contradicting himself very clearly. How does this make sense? And I asked myself these questions a number of times, and you know, I I concluded that th there is a part of us, right? That, that there's a part of us, namely a part of our spirit that contains the Holy Spirit. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. In other words, that God joins us to his Holy Spirit in our spirit. 
And, you know, at one point in my life, I concluded, wow, I have a regenerated human spirit. That means that uh, my spirit is fully 100% holy and there's no evil or wickedness or corruption on my spirit at all because I am joined to the Lord. As a matter of fact, my spirit doesn't even need a ministry. It won't need any kind of development or maturity because it is fully established in its eternal state of oneness with God upon salvation. I'm so excited. But then I realized that's not true at all. Um, as a matter of fact, We'll be getting into that later, that the spirit can actually be cleansed of filthiness even after we are saved, which is interesting. As a matter of fact, a lot of when you get into, you know, ministry of the human spirit, which is something that we have talked about on this program and uh, we definitely do engage in at Bride Ministries. We, we acknowledge, look, we are created a three part being. May the God of all peace sanctify you holy. I pray your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So we, we know that we are created three part being, and that spirit part of us actually does need ministry, even after we're saved. I'm, and I tell you, you begin to minister to people's spirits, and you see just how broken and how out of alignment people are in this area of themselves. Anyway, uh, but there is a part of our spirit, and I wouldn't even say the whole thing, and that's where it began to really click for me. It's like there's a designated area or portion of our spirit that is designed to contain the Holy Spirit. And once that part of our spirit is occupied by the Holy Spirit, that particular area, that thing, that construct, that is a component of our spirit, cannot be touched. However, it's not our entire spirit. And um, 2 Corinthians 7.1 is key here, which says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us. Now, Paul says us because he is a Christian who is saved by the grace of faith in Jesus Christ. And he is talking to other Christians and, and he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now, he wouldn't say and spirit if the spirit weren't intended to be included in the conversation on cleansing. And so filthiness can be upon the flesh. Of course, you know, sometimes you roll in the mud, you take a bath afterwards, right? Um, sometimes we uh, may think some defiling thoughts with our soul, which contains our mind, will, and our emotions. Yeah, we might need to cleanse ourselves with some living water and the blood of Jesus and repent. And we, you know, but, but then there's also this idea that, yeah, well, we have to cleanse ourselves of filthiness of the spirit. And he said, let us. And when he says us, that means he's including himself, which means that this isn't just for people that are about to get saved. This is for people that are already saved and may have been walking with the Lord for a long time. You know, in, in practical ministry, I've found that, look, uh, people's human spirits can be um, walking wounded. They may be, um, you know, literally presenting with spears or arrows, impaling them, going through them when they are met. Uh, there, there is all kinds of uh, afflictions that can come upon people's human spirits. And, and I'm talking about individuals that have been saved for years when I begin to get into the ministry with them. It's interesting. So, you know, th this, is, this, is a, this is the thing. But there, there is a part of our spirit that is occupied by the Holy Spirit, I would say, John's talking about this when he says, look, that, that thing can't be touched because in order for the enemy to touch that, he'd have to touch God's pure, perfect holiness, which he can't. He just, he, he just can never go that far. He might be able to take a snapshot of it. He might be able to get close to it, but he, he can't touch it. Um, and so that leaves a lot on the drawing board for the enemy to touch, which is why I say, well, no, see, the enemy can touch components of our existence. There's just that part, that, that place where the Holy Spirit occupies us that is off limits. Now, the enemy can attack our mind. He can attack our will. He can attack our emotions. And every single person that's listening to me talks would say, amen, because you know it's true. The enemy has plenty of fiery arrows he's shooting at you all the time. You know, uh, that person in your office that just, keeps on um, taking your stapler. I mean, th there's so many ways the devil can get in under our skin and, and do things and goodness gracious. Uh, he stops at nothing 
to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember, John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come, and this is Jesus talking, that you may have life and life more abundantly. So um, that kind of begins a conversation on, oh, wait, maybe we have been a little bit overly generous in how we've applied a, a passage like 1 John 5.18. Where we're trying to develop a philosophy on how we wish things worked, but really we're being over generous. Like we're not taking the whole counsel of the Word of God into account as 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 we do something like say, well, the enemy just can't touch Christians carte blanche. Period. And maybe we need to not do that. Maybe we need to take the whole counsel in the Word of the Word of God into consideration and say, how does one John five eighteen fit into that? You know. Uh, the Holy Spirit in us can't sin, right? The enemy can't touch the Holy Spirit in us, in that component of our human spirit. But that does not include the whole human spirit according to 2 Corinthians 7.1. And so there's a whole lot of levels above that, right? So that means our spirit realm, our soul realm, our physical realm, all can be under the affliction and assault of the kingdom of darkness. And this is why we need to know Deliverance 101. This is why we need to know spiritual warfare. This is why we need to know the healing promises of God and how to stand um, in all that we have received as New Covenant believers. Now, moving on, the parable of the unforgiving servant is a great picture into um, just how some of these uh, you know, mechanics work when we talk about, well, if the enemy can touch you know, components of our person, how does that work then? Well, in Matthew 18, you have a story where Jesus is like, look, there was this servant and he owed his Lord a lot of money. So he went and asked and begged for mercy and, and the Lord forgave him of his debt, the master. And then he had somebody, the same servant that owed him cash. It was like a little bit, it was a tiny bit. And he threw him in prison. Well, this uh, got back to his Lord and, and it picks up and Verse 32, and it says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desired me. Should, thou, should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on you, or thee? And his Lord was wroth, it means wrathful, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye... From your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. Which is, which is really tough, because what Jesus is essentially saying here is, look, um, spiritually speaking, for the believer, there is absolutely no grounds for unforgiveness. Zero. None. End of story, period. It doesn't matter what people have done to you. And, 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 and this is a real struggle, and this is a hard and challenging message always, every time it comes up, particularly for those that have suffered abuse at the hands of very wicked and evil people. Um, it, it's a trap. It's a challenge. It's like, well, how, how can I forgive? I could say I forgive them, but I don't even feel it. it, it does, how do I know I've even forgiven somebody? All of these questions come up, and you know, this is really material for another show to get into all of the questions around unforgiveness and how to forgive and how to journey forgiveness and how to forgive by faith and how, you know, how this all comes about. And, 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 and it's true. Forgiveness can be a journey and forgiveness can happen in layers. I, I will say that the mystery of dissociation helps us to, you know, really truly have an explanation for why a person can still be under attack through the door of unforgiveness when, in fact, they have with all of their best efforts for given something or someone. Um, and, and, you know, here's how it works with dissociation. Let's say um, Sue had, had, or, yeah, had, a, had a memory that, you know, her dad raped her and, and she has a part named Betty. And, well, Betty never presents. So Sue gets the memories back and this horrible thing happened and, and, and she forgives this horrible thing. Uh, with, to the best of her ability. And, and, and yet she's still getting attacked through this door of unforgiveness. And uh, she may even get a prophetic word about it. Like someone says, look, I can see the Lord is showing me that you're operating in unforgiveness. And they're like, well, I, but I've forgiven that, though. That doesn't even make any sense. Why is God condemning me for something I've already tried to let go? This is so frustrating. And, and really what's happening there is that uh, Sue has not met Betty. She, she's unaware that Betty is somewhere on the inside. This is a dissociated part of her. And Betty, since she never presents, 
and never moves beyond the amnesiac wall, never actually forgives. And so Betty holds on to unforgiveness deep inside of Sue. And well, because of Betty's unforgiveness, which is a part of Sue, uh, the enemy retains legal rights to harass Sue. And it's because of Betty. And this is how people stay in bondage. I mean, for untold amounts of time. I mean, people have so many problems through back doors like this, where it's just like, oh yeah, I as the person that's, you know, pretty convinced that I'm the only one who's uh, presenting ever. Uh, I'm completely amnesic of my parts and therefore, you know, we, we just get stuck because <laughs> we're not the only one that has feelings and emotions and thoughts on the inside of us. We, <laughs> the enemy is banking. He's actually counting on the fact that we will absolutely reject any kind of revelation from God that would suggest we do have parts that do need to go through their own inner healing journey so that our back doors are shut. And um, anyway, I'm just trying to show how some of this plays out. But really what Jesus is saying here is you have no excuse to not forgive. And, and when you engage in unforgiveness, that becomes what we call legal right. And it's legal, right? The word of God declares my Father in heaven will turn you over to the tormentors. That means that Satan is able to send his tormentors to you when you engage in unforgiveness because um, Jesus said that's what the Father would turn those <laughs> that, that consider themselves servants of Jesus Christ over to. <laughs> it's this simple. And I remember, you know, when I, was, when, I, when I went to college, man, I was upset. I was just angry. I was angry at my mom, and I love my mom. Guys, I really love my mom, and she did a fantastic job of raising me, and she, she did her best to keep me out of trouble. And of course, as a teenager, I, I had some issues with that. I had some problems, and man, oh man, I, was I about to make her pay. When I went to college, I was like, I'm not even gonna call. And I called home like you know maybe once every two or three weeks. I mean, I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And uh, then I, I, you know, I, I just came home for winter break that first year of, I was back from college and I was, I was upset and cold and, um, you know, I was civil, but cold. Like, you know, since I was, I, I was of a mind, I was like, yeah, she, she's going to get punished by my coldness. And I was harboring unforgiveness and I was angry and really, you know, did she do anything that was so horrible? It mandated unforgiveness. Not really. I, you know, it was kind of a disagreement as to approach in parenting, like, you know, and, and what, so sometimes we can actually harbor unforgiveness towards things or people that didn't do anything wrong, truly. But from our perspective, we receive some kind of injury, and so we're just upset. Uh, many people have unforgiveness towards God. They don't even know it or think it's possible or uh, think it's allowed. Um, I'll tell you, so many deliverances I've found have come from people releasing their unforgiveness towards God. And God doesn't do anything wrong. But sometimes we just don't understand, right? So we have a difference of opinion. Well, I had a difference of opinion, and that opened me up folks it opened me up and so within a couple nights of me getting home for my winter break from that first year of college i i was in a dream and in a dream i was um in my parents basement and i saw like a, a shadow being and the shadow being had like a, a workshop and he opened up a portal and this weird spirit came through that was like a witch but it was wearing these this multicolored garment and doing this very strange dance didn't talk it was doing this very strange dance and i was um like oh my gosh here we go and i was trying to get up the stairs out of the basement in the dream and then it felt like you know i, I was walking through sludge it was very difficult for me to move in the dream you know it's just like oh yeah this is totally a demon dream here and um, I got to the top of the stairs from the basement and in the dream, you know, that that spirit had followed me up there and then got to the top of the stairs. And I was just like watching it do this strange dance. And then I woke up and I heard with my physical ears what sounded like a chime. And then I knew I was like, oh, no. And I just had a singing feeling. Like I'm like, I have just received an assignment against me. And sure enough, the spirit began to harass me uh, for 
weeks. And I'll, I'll tell you what, it, it, was, it was what I would call a siren type spirit. What that means is that it's, it actually had the capacity to sing and make music. And so beginning a, a night or two after I got back from college for my winter break, um, I would lay down to go to sleep. And as I was getting to that point of nearly falling asleep, this music would begin and it was so beautiful. I mean, it was like this is the most beautiful music and it would immediately put me in a trance. So I would be falling asleep and then I'd trance out. And of course it didn't stop there because as soon as I trance, then the demon would jump on me and like wrestle with me and beat me up. <laughs> and uh, I mean, my physical body would be experiencing a type of sleep paralysis, but you know, I know I'm like, you know, getting beat up on and it was horrible. And I'd have to like shake myself out of it, wake myself up. And then I would rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And when I did that, what would happen is that it would, and of course this was long before I had the evening prayer or any, <laughs> any of those tools. I was just, you know, using my my, my, my my one weapon, right? The name of Jesus. And so I would just rebuke it. i say, get out of here in Jesus' name. I rebuke you. Leave in the name of Jesus, right? And so what would happen was the spirit would actually just walk over into the corner of my room. And it's like I would know it was just still in the room, like in the corner, on the ceiling, just watching and then I would go to fall asleep again and um, like when I would be in the quiet, like I wouldn't see it with my physical eyes. This is like a, a knowing. But then, you know, I'd go to fall asleep again and then the music would start again. And I would trance out and then it would attack again. And folks, this would happen two or three times a night. And this went on for weeks. I was in a state of torment. I was just tormented. I wasn't sleeping. Um, it was really bad. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about a week and a half, two weeks in to this stuff. I was just like, I'm going to need to leave my parents' house and go sleep over a friend's house or something for the rest of my winter break because this is just intolerable. I can't deal with this. Um, and so I'm going through it. And then, you know, finally, towards the very end of that, Stint, which was about three weeks for for that break. I just prayed, and I was like, "Oh God, you know, I know that my heart isn't where it needs to be right now, and I know that I'm I'm actually actively <laughs> trying to turn away from you right now and be, you know, do do whatever the whatever I feel like. But I I just I'm so sorry. I I can't do this." And I really need help. This is just horrible. This is torment. What am I going to do? And God in his great grace and mercy spoke to me and he just said, you're under attack because you are angry at your mom and you refuse to forgive her. And um, that just hit me like a pile of bricks. And I was like, wow, that's true. So I forgave my mom. And um, I mean, like I said, I, you know, I don't even I, I can't even say that she did anything wrong. I, this was my problem. And but I, I forgave her for, you know, doing things that I disagreed with. And I released my anger and my bitterness. I just surrendered it. And God was faithful and just to take it away from me. And then I wrote her a letter and explained all these things and left it for her. And, you know, um, I'll tell you what. After I released the unforgiveness, I let go of the anger, I let go of the bitterness, all the stuff associated. I said, and I command uh, that singing spirit to get out of my life in Jesus name. It was gone for good. It was gone for good. And this is an example of how this passage is absolutely relevant. The, the Bible says, you know, uh, his Lord delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due him. So likewise, my heavenly father shall do to you also, if you do not from your hearts, forgive everyone, his brother, their trespasses. What, what that's saying is there was a legal right 
for the enemy to attack you if you engage in unforgiveness. Well, unforgiveness is not the only legal right that the enemy has to afflict believers at all. And um, so, so we just learn a valuable lesson here. Right. Sometimes if we deal with the reason why we're being attacked, then we can cancel the attack and the attack will simply not return. But as long as I was maintaining that legal ground, which was the unforgiveness in my heart, that spirit never had to go much further than the corner of the bedroom. It just didn't. And so I would cast it out in the name of Jesus and it would just go to the corner. That's why. Now. Um, we're going to address some other arguments as we're talking through this, you know, because it's, it's just important for us to get a grasp on some of these things. You know, there are people that would argue, well, that's a cool story, Daniel, but um, Galatians 3.13 says that Jesus became a curse for us, so we can't have any spiritual problems. And then there are others that would say, well, yeah, but, you know, the Bible does say that light and darkness cannot dwell together. Therefore, Christians cannot be demonized or have any other kinds of problems. Well, I would say that these objections are actually partially warranted because there are scriptures that have been applied in order for people to come to these conclusions. It's not without an application of scripture. The question is, have the scriptures that have been applied to come to these conclusions been applied properly and in the context of the whole revelation found in the word of God? And, and, and the answer is no. In my opinion, not at all. And uh, because I deal in this ministry a lot, uh, I, I, I just have to say, I, I know, I know that it is not true that Christians will never have a problem from the demonic. Not true at all. Um, so. There's another passage in the, in, in the book of Acts that really helps us to realize what we're actually dealing with when it comes to Christians and, and Christians being demonized, having problems from the demonic, having open doors, whatever have you. And what happens in, in the book of Acts is that there's this guy named Simon. Now, Simon's a sorcerer. And Philip, Philip is an evangelist. And he goes... And begins to preach and teach, and Simon, who is a sorcerer, who's really been acclimated to many wild things in the occult, sees the power that Philip is walking in, and he's just blown away. So the Bible says in Acts 8, verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. You know, Philip, Philip not only preached the gospel of the kingdom and uh, saw the salvation experience of Simon, he also baptized Simon in water. And then took Simon on as a disciple. Simon followed him around. Simon followed him around. He's like, wow, you know, um, I'm going to take in as much as I can. Now, here's the deal, right? What is salvation? We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2.8. Simon was saved by grace through faith. That's how he got saved. Furthermore, he had been baptized according to the commandment of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Um, you know, this means that he was covered by the blood of Jesus and declared to be the righteousness of God in Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's, like, that's, that's what's going on with Simon. And that's what we need to understand when we read what happens next. Because if, if we don't understand that, then we can go back to that initial uh, situation that I was describing where a Christian messes up and then suddenly their salvation is brought into question by those around them. Well, well, if you were really saved, you would have never done this. If you were really saved, you would have never committed adultery. If you were actually saved, you would have never committed fornication. If you, you know, and, and on and on. It's like, if you were this, then you should have never done that. And so we, we, we just keep this condemnation on people. There's... Uh, 
there's this, this constant effort to actually get people saved. And I think, well, the battlefield isn't to get people saved. The battlefield is to bring people into the full expression of what they received as children of God. That's a journey. That's a journey of inner healing, deliverance, redemption, renewing of the mind, reprogramming of the heart, on and on and on. And on that journey, people do scrape their knee and screw up and mess up, and sometimes in really big ways. Anyway, uh, what happens is, is that there are some other apostles that come up, right? So Simon is believed he's baptized. He's following Philip around. He's getting discipled. Peter and John go up, and they go to the, impart the gift of the Spirit, so they begin to lay hands on people and they begin to pray and speak in other tongues. And Simon sees what Peter and John are doing. And so he goes to Peter and John and he says, Hey, if I give you money, will you give me this gift? Well, this was a big problem. And so... Uh, Peter calls him out on this. I mean, I mean and, and this is what he says. Peter said unto him in Acts chapter 8, verse 20, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. See, Simon was saved. We've already been through that. But later on in the story, he sins. And his sin is because he is in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds. That means the bondage the chains of iniquity. Simon had yet to undergo deliverance and inner healing. He had been saved, but he came from a background of occultism. He may have been ritualized into his position in the kingdom of darkness. He needed real healing and real deliverance in order to walk in a full expression of what Jesus had purchased for him. And he had not been afforded that opportunity. And so when he acted out of line from that place, Peter says, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. What this means is that believers can be in bondage even though they're saved. That's literally what we're seeing in the Bible. And so when people begin to talk about, say, oh, well, Christians can't have any demonic problems, I'm like, well, what about Simon? I mean, this is, this, I, I really don't think the Bible could be any clearer as we get into the story and what's actually happening. He is saved. And he is in bondage. You know, two plus two still equals four. So I think that, you know, sometimes we just need to um, you get a little bit more information if we are still in that place where we're struggling with the idea that, you know, deliverance is a real ministry. And, I, and I've, I've been around Christians that actually do not believe that deliverance is part of the Christian conversation at all. And um, I love them. I just don't, I just can't agree. Deliverance is part of the agenda that Jesus has for people that are in his kingdom. So just like Simon, Christians can be in spiritual bondage, chains, even prisons. And this is after we're saved. Uh, and so these spiritual issues will lead to sin if they aren't dealt with properly. Uh, they will continue our pattern of backsliding if we don't address them and deal with them. They will bring destruction into our lives. So the question then becomes, well, how can this be true if Jesus became a curse for us? So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, if we read through the Torah and we look at the law and um 
all of the curses in it, we do realize there is a curse of the law, and it, it comes for breaking the law. So Jesus, when he comes and becomes a, a, a curse for us, what does that mean in context of the actual experience a believer is going to have? Well, let me tell you, Jesus becoming a curse for us purchases for us essentially the right to be completely free of all curses relative to the law. This, this grants provision for freedom, but the over application is to think that it's an automatic when really we must receive his provision for our freedom by faith. The reality of our freedom exists as a component of the finished work of Jesus Christ. But this reality must be enforced throughout the first and second heavens before it truly impacts our lives. And this is where we get it confused. You see, because... Whatever God established in the third heaven, paradise, where he is, where he has books written of our lives to detail all of his agendas and plans for us that are great and mighty. What we, we think that just because we're saved, it's automatically coming into alignment with earth. It's not. Heaven and earth remain out of alignment continually, and they are only brought into alignment through our faith, obedience, and purposeful engagement of God's kingdom. And... It's, it's, it's a journey that we all have to take with God. And so, really, the same principle applies to divine healing. Guys, the Bible clearly says that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. And that's a past tense word, were, 1 Peter 2.24. But then we ask, do Christians still get sick? Everybody said, amen. <laughs> of course Christians still get sick. You know, we get allergy response. We, we, have, we go through cancer. We have plenty of believers that have you know infections and skin diseases we get sometimes we can yeah i mean all everything right it all applies to us as believers as well as unbelievers it's not like you get saved and you can't get sick anymore uh, and so it's said, like, well what do we do with first peter 2 24 which says that by the stripes of jesus we were healed well if we understand that the finished work of jesus christ is established in him we can use our faith to bring our life into alignment with his finished work and that will reveal Christ in us, the hope of glory, re reveal his finished work and break the power of that sickness in our lives. So faith is constantly bringing heaven and earth into alignment, pulling on the resources of the third heaven or God's kingdom as we engage his realm as citizens of it and those that have an entitlement to do that. So, like, I, I mean, this, this then gets into how, right, we, we live a kingdom centered lifestyle it's not about oh we just get the free ticket automatic that that approach to christianity is is so outdated it's it just because it's because it doesn't work it's it does not work to assume that you get saved and everything is just hunky-dory you still have physical sickness. You still are going to have demonic problems. You are still going to have issues with, uh, you know, wrong belief systems in your heart. You are still going to have all these things that need to be worked out through a process of sanctification. We have a journey of faith where we are going to contend for the things that God has done for us. And, and, and that's the Christian journey. That's, that's ministry, life in the real world, guys. And so, um, like with healing, the provision for our sin, our healing is purchased by Jesus, but the reality of our healing exists really in the third heaven, and it must be enforced into the lower dimensions, the second heaven, the first heaven, by faith and obedience to Jesus. And the same is going to go for, for breaking the power of the demonic in our lives. Yeah, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and our freedom is a purchased, it's established, it's set in the heaven of God, but it must be enforced. We have to do that by faith, you know? And 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 agreement and obedience and, and walking this thing out. Now, there are some who say that spiritual problems are impossible for the Christian to have because, look, where the light is, there could be no darkness. So a Christian can't be demonized. Because if we have the light of God in us, then darkness can't be there. The best the devil can do is send a bad thought our way. 
<laughs> well, you know, I, I, I always think it's funny because when, when people have this attitude, I will just say, well, then why don't you sit down in a session with one of the people that I help and help them with your philosophy? It, because the truth is it won't work. It just doesn't work. You know, you, you could tell a person all you want. The light can't dwell where the darkness is. I mean, you, you could literally put that on repeat and just tell them over and over and over and over again. No matter how many times you tell somebody that, it is not going to break the power of Leviathan um, that's entered their life through generational iniquity and rituals. Won't do it. It, it, it just will not get that job done. That has to be engaged. And um, so, you know, it's, it's a good chuckle. You know, uh, it's, uh, the, people have to live in a fantasy world sometimes, I think, to maintain their agreement with bad teaching. They just have to do this thing where they say, well, you know, we believe this, but we don't minister to people that come from a background of satanic ritual abuse. <laughs> <laughs> we stay away from those people, right? That's that 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 has to be kind of where things park if you're going to try to continue to hold to certain beliefs. And 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 you know, we, we still love people that take that approach. I just, you know, I don't. Now, what happens is 1 Peter 2:9 does say this. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should shew forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are called into the light of God. This is true. And as a matter of fact, in John 1, 5, it says, And a light shineth in darkness, and a darkness comprehended it not. You know, the Bible does say that darkness does not comprehend the light. Um, but uh, <laughs> the Bible actually does not say that where the light is, there can be no darkness. Like that, it, it actually does. <laughs> uh, let, let's look at a, a few other passages to kind of flesh this one out, right? Um, this idea of light and darkness not cohabitating has absolutely nothing to do with the idea that a redeemed human spirit cannot have any element of darkness or soul or whatever level of our existence we're talking about. The Bible actually says in 1 John 2, 9, He that says he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. And here's a, here's a wild thing, okay? Hate. A person can be saved. They might even be able to speak in other tongues and be full of hatred. As a matter of fact, a person can be saved full of tongues and all kinds of good works and something happens to them in their lives that's just d totally devastating and they move into hatred in response to the stimuli like all of these agendas can happen of course you can be unsaved and in hate but this is a deal no matter what condition we enter into that place of hatred in the bible says he that says he's in the light and hate is his brother, is in darkness even until now. That means that hatred will bring a darkness into our lives that will cohabitate the light in us if we are saved and engaging in that hatred. That's what the Bible actually says. Luke 11.35 says, Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. John 12, 35 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goes. Hmm. You know, th 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 there's just a number of passages that do deal with light and darkness, but none of them will help us to conclude the idea that, well, a Christian can't have demonization. Like, that conclusion is not to be found. And that's the point, right? Um, that's the point. That's my whole point. And my whole point is I've heard people like say this, like as if they're quoting some kind of relevant scripture proving their point. Where the light is, there can be no darkness. So Christians can't, like that, that is not a real thing. That's not a real conclusion. It's not a real scripture quote. It's, it's just, you know, we're, we're actually quoting all the actual scriptures dealing with light and darkness. And they simply say what they say. 
They simply say what they say. Yeah, we are called out of darkness. Um, during the creation, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But he that hated his brother is in darkness even until now. Like, so this is my point. And, and then we can even go to different levels of our existence, right? Because I call the heart the equivalent of the subconscious. It is the lowest regions of the human soul overlapping upon the spirit. And the Bible says of the heart in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Like the heart can actually be a source of deception for us in our lives. It's not like we get saved. Jesus lives in our heart and boom, our heart is just the best thing ever. And we just do whatever is in our heart. Because if I have bitterness in my heart as a believer and I just listen to my heart, I'm going to have a problem because I'm going to do things I regret. And that's where we, where we are. Like, you know, the, the Christian journey is actually a journey of allowing God to change our hearts in one area after another. We want God to get the bitterness out of our heart, the unforgiveness out of our heart, the, um, the uh, malice out of our heart, the uh, addiction out of our heart. All these things like this, our, our walk with God is a process of this stuff, guys. So um, the heart can really, truly be a place of deception if our heart is we're pulling from an area of our heart that hasn't been surrendered to God. Following our heart can be like the worst thing to do. You know, some people say, well, you know, well, you, you need to follow your heart into the relationship that will satisfy you and make your life wonderful. Yeah, right. Um, You know, yeah, if you're following the redeemed part of your heart where God dwells into a relationship, God will pull you towards the person that he has for you. But sometimes what's in our heart is a whole lot of mess. And our demons are going to attract us to somebody else's demons. And we're going to come together and we're going to have World War Three. <laughs> following our heart. You know, so we, we, we have to apply some wisdom here, guys. You know, the Bible... The Bible does actually have really good stuff. We just have to understand what it's saying. You know, um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Uh, our hearts need to be established unblameable in holiness. That, that's not an automatic. That's not an automatic, like that's a journey. God wants to take us to that place where our hearts are established, unblameable. They won't start there. Now I guarantee you, you get saved, you have issues. I have issues. I mean, we're, we're all working our issues out towards this goal of being established, unblameable. And um, many times that's actually God's goal for us and not even our goal for ourselves because we don't think God can do that much for us. Once we journey this thing a little bit, we realize just how far we are away from the mark that is the person of Jesus and everything he is. And we're like, whoa, that distance is so vast. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I don't have no hope of, of taking that journey there. I'll just settle. So God has a, an agenda to establish us unblameable. Sometimes we don't even agree with that. But, you know, th that's, that's his goal for us. And it should be our goal for us in him. You know, it's always good to agree with God. But it's a journey. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot to, to be said. Like, you know, um, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Like, we were talking about different levels of our existence. We're talking about spirit. We're talking about the heart. We're talking about the mind or the soul. Every level of us can be hacked. Every level of our existence can be hacked. Our spirit can have filthiness. The light can be with, you know, there, there can be darkness in our spirit area. There, there can be um, confusion and deception in our hearts. There can be confusion and corruption in our minds, our soul. And I, I, I'll tell you the truth. Well, in ministry, help, have, having an understanding of the different levels of existence is extremely helpful as we are applying the finished work of Jesus Christ to people's lives and seeing the chains break and seeing them come to a new level of fruitfulness and a new level of peace and a new level of ability to experience God and his joy and presence. We're, we're, we're breaking stuff in Jesus' name and in, in the soul and the mind and the emotions down in the heart level and subconscious and all the way into the ministry to the human spirit and dealing with stuff on that level. It's, it, it's just the way it is. So, 
It is absolutely possible for Christians to have demonization and demonization on different levels of their person. Absolutely possible. So, um, again, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Amplified Version says, Therefore, since these great promises are ours, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration and completeness to the reverential fear of God. Okay, so we're understanding, like, okay, this whole idea of needing deliverance is scriptural. This is why we're doing Deliverance 101. I mean, there's a lot of advanced spiritual warfare stuff we're talking about all the time, but what about the basics? Look, we're talking about the basics today. These are the basics. The Christians need deliverance. As a matter of fact, I would say that deliverance is the children's bread. It's, it's, it's the children's bread. You know, the um, Samaritan woman had come to Jesus, and, and she wanted her daughter healed, and, and Jesus was like, mm, I'm called to the children of Israel. Uh and, and he was talking about the children's bread. And the woman responded and said, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs that come off the master's table. In Matthew 15, 25 through 27, then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, this is one of the most offensive things I think Jesus ever said. But she comes back and she says, truth, Lord, Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And, and you know, Jesus actually just says, sorry, she's healed. You, you get what you were looking for. But Jesus refers to deliverance as the children's bread. And, and who are the children of God but us? We are now children of the Most High God. We are given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Deliverance is truly the children's bread. And so... In, in this uh, uh, podcast, we're just going to go through some basic points, right? There, there is actually a very straightforward way to administer deliverance for others or even self-ministry that I use all the time. I mean, I, I use this all the time, you know, and I, I have a, a box of tools that I apply whenever I'm working with people. But this is definitely one of them. And it, it's just a five-step process I take people through to break stuff off on a surface level. And we're going to talk about it. So those five steps, I'll just give them to you um, to, to get basic level deliverance. One, confess the sin. Two, repent of the sin. Three, renounce the sin. Four, bind every demonic spirit working through the gateway opened by the sin. And five, drive out every demonic spirit working through through the gateway opened by the sin. It, it's a five-step process, very, very simple, and this is why it works. Um, you know, there are sins, right? And just because we are New Covenant believers does not mean that sin no longer applies as a part of our conversation. Like the Bible literally says, he who has no sin deceives himself um, and, and is lying. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, there's a long list of sins. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. I mean, we, we can even expand into certain parts of Torah. We know that bestiality is sin. And it's not even referenced in the New Testament as sin, but I'll, I'll guarantee you what, that is a violation of God's moral code, and it qualifies as sin, and that thing will open up all kinds of demonic to a person's life. Like, so... We, we, we talk about, look, there is a reality of sin. And so because we are navigating a fallen and dark world as the children of light, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 5 through 10, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, the word confess means to say the same thing as or to concede. It's a legal term. You know, the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us. He says, you're jealous. 
Now, when that word hits, I say, boom, ooh, I am jealous. I am so jealous of Patty. Gosh darn it, Patty, I hate you. Now, you, you know, you're jealous. You're being convicted. You are being convicted because the Holy Spirit knows you're in darkness because you're jealous. Like, and you hate. <laughs> We've been through some of these verses, right? Like, this is, this is the thing. Confession means to say the same thing. as So when the Holy Spirit comes and nails us with some conviction, that's when we respond appropriately. We don't run from God. We run to God. Why? Because we're accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in Jesus Christ. And while we have positional righteousness in Jesus Christ, there is this other side of positional righteousness, namely, um, what are we doing with our lives on this planet and on this side of reality and how is that opening back doors for the enemy to sabotage and hack us and there is an unrighteousness that we do need to be cleansed of when we sin so the uh the bible says when we confess so that means say the same thing as he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness this means that when the holy spirit says you're jealous we say oh i feel that that's right I am jealous. Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and I confess that I am jealous. I am so jealous of Patty because her brownies always come out better than mine and I'm upset. That's the first step of self-deliverance, guys. And, and this is actually a step of helping people to be set free in Jesus' name when you are ministering to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Confession's first step. It, 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 it is a, a, a legal step in, in, in conceding to what the Holy Spirit has pointed out. Now, once we've done that, we get to repent. Now, the, the, the word repent means to change our thinking. It means that we were going one direction, but we are going to turn 180 degrees and go the other direction. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Uh, Romans 2.4, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance you know repentance isn't something that we only do at salvation yeah we do change our thinking at salvation we're going the way of the world and then we meet jesus and we decide to go the way of jesus which is 180 degrees opposite of the way of the world but you know then there are all the individual areas of our lives that once we come to that place of conviction and we re re we confess it then we are making a determination that we are going to go the other direction <laughs> i was jealous Gosh darn it, Patty. Just why? Why are your brownies so delicious? Mine stick to the pan and they're always greasy. And you won't share your recipe with me, you evil person, you. When we confess that, we're not allowed to do that anymore. We have to repent. That means we have to say, you know what, God? I am actually choosing to cooperate with a different attitude towards Patty. I'm going to pray for Patty. Lord Jesus, would you just bless Patty? Would you bless her with even more opportunity to share her wonderful brownies with others? Like, we have to, we have to repent. We have to change our thinking about how we are engaging around that sin, right? And then, and, and then we renounce. So, 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 so to confess means to say the same thing as, or to concede, to repent means to change our thinking. To renounce means to break agreement. 2 Corinthians 4.2 But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. When, when we are you know, getting free, this is this, what I would use as a third step. And I, and I follow this pattern all the time, guys. I mean, it, it works really well. It works wonders. So, so, so here's how it looks. Holy Spirit, whammo, you are jealous. Ah, I concede, God, you're right. Father God, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and I confess that I am jealous of 
patty and her delicious brownies that are always better than mine, and I repent. I'm sorry that I was so wicked towards her in my heart, and I even uh, went in her house one time and replaced her sugar with uh, flour, and I'm pretty sure she didn't notice, and that's how that one batch got ruined, but then she figured it out, and I, I repent. I'm not going to do it anymore, God, and I renounce my jealousy of Patty and her brownies. Now, once we renounce it, we, we are in the spirit realm, smashing all agreement with jealousy. Now, jealousy as a spiritual construct that is a gateway to evil demonic power is now collapsed. All agreements broken and the, the, the legal requirements for the cleansing of God from that sin have already been met because we confessed. So when we confess, repent, renounce, that, that's it. It's over. Now what happens is that there's a bunch of demons floating around because, man, have they been milking your jealousy towards Patty Brownies to bring affliction not only to your life but to Patty's life any way they can. They're going to afflict Patty through you. When the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness, like if that, that passage is talking about you because you're jealous of Patty. And Patty is fighting the demons that are charging your jealousy. <laughs> so, so here's what we, what we realize. We are actually working for the devil because we're being pirated and hacked. What we do is we say, wait a minute. Not only have I renounced what I was doing, but I also recognized that I was being pirated and hacked by these evil guys. Therefore, step four is to bind every demonic spirit working through the gateway opened by the sin of jealousy. So you say, Father God, I renounce the jealousy that I had towards Patty and in the name of Jesus, I declare that every demon and evil spirit Spirit working against me and others through jealousy is now bound. This will cause all of the demons that were on assignment because of that door to suddenly be tied up. But here's where Christians can really mess up because we don't see the spirit realm always. What we won't see is that if we just tie stuff up and leave it there, it's just going to be there. We have to be more specific. We have to say what happens next. Because I don't, like, let's say someone came in my house and I caught them and tied them up and put them in the corner of my house. Like they would just sit in the corner of my house for as long as it took them to break out of the ropes I used to tie them up. And once those ropes broke, they'd be back at work. Like we don't just bind demons. We have to bind them and send them somewhere for judgment, punishment, and sentencing for what they did. So the next step is to do that. So you then would say, step five, and in the name of Jesus, I declare that every demon that has just been bound is sent to where the true Lord Jesus Christ sends them. Get out. This is where deliverance manifests. And not only have you confessed and been cleansed, You've repented. You've renounced the agreement. You have also bound and removed every evil spirit working in your environment as well. This is deliverance 101. So the whole prayer from beginning to end would look something like this. Holy Spirit comes in, whammo, you are jealous of Patty and her brownies. Father God, I come before you prayer in the mighty name of Jesus, and I confess that I am jealous of Patty and her brownies. I repent. I am sorry, God, that I was jealous of Patty and her brownies, and I am going to live different. I bless Patty in Jesus' name. And Lord God, I renounce my jealousy of Patty and Patty's brownies. And in the name of Jesus, I now bind every evil spirit, every demon working against me through the open gate, the open door 
of jealousy. And I declare that they are all being taken now where the true Lord Jesus Christ sends them. Get out. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for setting me free. Amen. Folks, with that said, we are actually done for the week. I, there are so many areas of life that this could be applied to. I mean, you could reply, apply it to rebellion. You could apply it to stubbornness. You could apply it to rage. You could apply it to false prophecy. You could apply it to resentment. You could apply it to envy, murder, being overbearing. I mean, you just name it, right? Your issue, fill in the blank. Five steps, deliverance 101. That's all I have to say. Folks, until next week, you've been listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. God bless and Godspeed. Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall is the premier radio program designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program has been a production of Bride Ministries. You can find us at www.bridemovement.com At our website, you can contact us, access resources, and support us with donations. We need partners in order to continue to produce our vision, which is to promote unity in the body of Christ worldwide and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. Partner with us. And be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.